Thank you so much. So this is joint work with my students, Daniel Kalina and uh, Kushagra Singhal. It's very closely related actually to Elsa's work and I'm not as eloquent as entertaining as her, so sorry if it's not fun, but at least you got the ideas because she did a great job. So uh, thank you for coming. So basically, why do we even care about this problem? So I just have a couple of slides to pretend that I care about application, but I really like the math. But anyway, so the idea is that it's, we are in the era of big data, and there is so much data around. And then we want to extract value, possibly, from all the data available to us. So ideally, we like to be able to perform analytics on that. But there is also privacy concerns in terms of all this analysis that could be done. So this is a huge concern, not only for private citizens, but actually uh, also companies and governments are players in this. As an example, EU has um, this regulation uh, that they have put forward and uh, basically the adaptation has already started and is supposed to be enforced by next December. So, oh, I guess December after that. <laughs> so, the, and it would go on immediate effect in all EU uh, member states. So, the interesting thing is I didn't know that, so I was a little bit reading about different type of um, um, regulations they have in the EU, and some of them are more requirements, and the governments, st different states have options to decide if they're going to adapt it or they're going to change it, but this is one of the ones that are mandated to all of the 28 states, and they have to actually follow this, right? So the issue is that uh, they want to make sure that um, uh, the personal data of their citizens are not compromised and they have put really huge penalties. So what was interesting for me was that I was uh, looking at this and they have up to 2% of the worldwide turnover as a possible penalty for something like Google. This would actually amount to basically $1 billion if they would get a fine of this sort. So these are huge penalties. Uh, there was an article on Guardian I read about it too, which I thought it was kind of funny. So they say that this sum is so big that would make even the Companies' bosses choke on their muesli. So, <laughs> what's wrong with this sentence? I don't think Americans eat muesli, right? So, I doubt that the Google folks are eating it. So, I thought that was a very European centric viewpoint. But on the other hand, I'm in Munich, so I'm enjoying muesli. So, <clears throat> And then they have a very broad definition <laughs> of what is actually personal data. So it could be anything relating to an individual, your post on social networking side, uh, sites, your medical data, your photos, email, even people's IP addresses that you know frequently are available. So this seems to be a very um, basically overarching um, uh, kind of rule and mandate and so in light of that clearly we feel that there is some urgent need to have some of these privacy preserving data analytics approaches and uh, basically there is incentive for a lot of these companies who gather and store ton of data to release it and they sell it right so you could use it for in-house use for various studies but also you have incentive to actually be people who use uh, to who sell this data and the question is can you curate it in a way that you can enable analytics without compromising privacy so so ideally we like to have actually provable guarantees that you can have um, um, basically data analytics, which is privacy preserving, and this provability could be in the computational or the information theoretic sense. So what I would talk about today is actually some of these converses. What is nice about them, they're information theoretic, so it means the adversary, no matter how much power he has, he cannot do anything. So this is actually the example that kind of gives the idea. I think Elsa had something very similar too. So let's assume that there is some ground truth graph available where it tells some relationship between various uh, identities or people and then there's associated with each person there's also some sensitive data which is denoted by this red dot. And also assume that there's another version of this relationship graph available on, say, some public domain, say a social network. It might be your friendship relationship or other type of relationships, possibly. But it doesn't have the sensitive, the red data. So now your goal is to release a version of this graph that has the sensitive information without actually compromising the identity of these users, right? So this is basically the issue that is at hand, right? So a provider has access to some sensitive data for labeled users. He wants to release a version of data that actually has the uh, 
uh, basically anonymized. So he, it has the sensitive data without having the labels. And what is not in his hand is actually this public graph. So this is the side information that can um, deter his notion of privacy. So this is what we are considering. So the goal is, yes? They're not necessarily exactly the same. So this could be a subgraph of this, okay. right, yeah. So, <clears throat> so for instance, you know, just think about even something like Facebook, right? So you might not reveal your friendships with everyone, but Facebook knows exactly who's friends with whom, right? But somebody who just sees the uh, public version of the data might not have all the information. So, so the goal is actually to, uh, for a third party, be able to do some sort of analytics, right? Get the information they're interested in on these graphs without uh, being able to de-anonymize or figure out who are the um, users. So this is the general goal. So let's keep it in mind. Then I'm going to first talk about a more specific problem. Then I'm going to give an instance of a situation where we're going to also do data analytics. Yes, Himachu. So the data is that this red dot, so for each label, there is a private information. So let's say it's your voting. So I know that Bob is Republican, and he has voted Republican, while Alice is Democrat. So I might want a third party be able to figure out in a certain region, right, so how many Republicans and Democrats are, so they do some sort of detection of the percentage of people that are of certain kind, without knowing specifically was this person Himanshu who voted a certain way. <clears throat> so the graph could be relationships. So say your relationship might be like people you frequent, right, or if they're your friends or some, and there's likelihood that, you know, they share your beliefs with you, right, or it could be something for instance, in medical records, oftentimes you can have some relationship, like say being part of a certain study group, you know, like there was some research study that, you know, uh, if you would, it would allow to de-anonymize people because, you know, if you consider a bunch of conditions, right, then it would allow you to narrow down and see who was the person who had a specific, uh, say, disease, right? So the problem is this, right? So one might naively think, okay, I'm going to change these labels. The issue is that, as you can see, because there are these kind of you know, relationships in the graph, the topology gives away quite a little bit to you, right? So it's not clear that if you just uh, were to remove the labels, this would anonymize the data. So this is the question, in some sense, we want to ask, right? So basically, this is, again, kind of, you know, I don't want to go too much through this because I think Elsa explained a lot of these things. And uh, this work in a formal setting uh, has been done by Pedro Sani and Grossglasser in uh, 2011. So they considered such a problem as well, this, uh, and basically anonymized networks. And it's very nice when somebody else formulates a problem for you. It's so much easier to work on it. So I think they should get the credit. So. What am I going to talk about today? So I'm going to talk about first a situation here, which is this basically problem of graph matching for Erdős-Rényi graphs, which is related to what I talk about, but it's not exactly the same thing. Then I'm going to talk about how, like you know, you have a certain notion of a map estimator, which is going to tell you what is the ideal uh, kind of thing for the attacker to do in terms of trying to learn the labels. We have a converse bound, and this converse bound is general. So basically, I, as far as I know, it's the first converse that allows you uh, to exactly guarantee a situation where you cannot learn the identities. We also have an achievability bound, and they're kind of close to each other, right? So I'm going to give a proof sketch for the converse, because first of all, it's easier. Secondly, um, I think it's the first converse with achievability results a la, um, uh, at least uh, Gross, Grosser, Pedrosani, and also Elza has been around as well. So then I'm going to do some comparison of our bounds with the existing literature. And I think this is also an interesting case. So I'm going to also talk about this anonymity for data analytics, which is what I was really talking about. So I would consider a specific analytics problem, which is community detection. Like the example I told you, you want to know what percentage of the people are Republican and how many of them are Democ Democrats without knowing specifically who voted which way, right? So this is, would be an example I would give in community detection. <clears throat> 
So what is graph matching? So basically graph matching is a classic problem, right? So you can have various versions of it. So this is how I like to define it. You can assume that you know, you're sampling some random graphs, right? And then uh, these graphs are somehow uh, jointly distributed according to some distribution D. And then what we do is that we take a sample which is uniformly permuting the vertices of the graphs, right? So you can call this mapping pi and then clear Clearly, it's gonna, you know, you can, when you have a mapping within the vertices of the um, permutation on the vertices, you can lift it to the edges, right? So it also induces a permutation on the edges. And basically, uh, then you would have this, which is a mapping from a pair of vertices, right, to each other. So if you would have such a map, then the problem I was just talking to you about, so remember we have two graphs, let's say GA and GB. So what I'm going to do is on, I'm going to anonymize this GA, hence I'm going to permute its vertices. So this is the, basically I'm going to now call it GC. So GC is just my original graph where I have now permuted its uh, vertices, hence it has also uh, basically induced a permutation on the edge set, right? And then I also have the other public graph, which is this GB. So when you know you present a GC, the anonymized graph where anonymization is done in this fashion, given the side information graph GB, the question is actually can you learn the pi? And what I mean by can you learn the pi is can you exactly learn the pi with high probability, right? So here is, I think this is something important to say. So Olgitsa had a very interesting comment uh, on the last talk, and this is absolutely correct. So we should be careful that when I start like talking about these type of models, it's not necessarily fit every data set, right? So clearly, for instance, Erdos-Schreini graphs are very poor graph models to study networks. But there is another other issue that I want to also emphasize. So this notion of analysis anonymity that I was talking about in some sense is very um, is very specific, right? So I, I would consider an attacker being successful if he can learn everybody's label. But you can imagine even if you earn 90%, 50%, even 20% of the user's identity is terrible, right? So there's another practical issue here as well that I think one can raise. So I don't want to just you know, brush this under the floor, so let's be cognizant of that. But I feel still there are very interesting problems to look at. So specifically, I'm going to consider this problem, the general de-anonymization, learning the pi mapping, for a case where my graphs are correlated Erdos-Schreini graphs. So I'm basically limiting the class of graphs that I'm considering. So what do I mean by that? So I have this GA and GB, uh, the two original graphs, that basically they are on some vertex set and they're defined. And I have this situation that I'm going to consider basically the indicator function of whether or not a edge E exist in these graphs, right? So it could be in both of them, or it could be in none of them, or in either one of them with some probability, right? So then, basically, I can just define this model as Erdos, Schreini, N, and P, where the P is this vector which is telling what is the likelihood of each of these events, right? So this actually defines the notion of Erdos, Schreini uh, correlated graphs, right? So the way, um, and then this is also true for the marginals of these graphs. So another way to think about getting correlated graphs, and this is what uh, Pedro Sani and uh, Grossglosser do in their work, is that they assume that you have an original graph. You can think about this as the you know, complete graph I had, not complete, like the um, info, private information graph I had earlier on, right? So, and then you can actually sample edges, right? So with some probability um, SA, you can sample edges here, and then with some SP here, and this probability is, and the way you actually sample edges are all independent of each other, right? So this also would actually, as long as the original graph was Erdos-Schreini, this would also induce another Erdos-Schreini correlated graphs, right? And you can, in fact, have a situation where you can relate our formulation of correlated graphs with these parameters, right? But I want to make a little comments. So I believe that the approach we use is a slightly more attractive because it can also allow you to study negatively correlated graphs. But it's a more minor point. So, so I prefer this type of um, definition to this one. But there's something nice about it that I think this is more understandable, right? So it's very clear in terms of application. What does this mean that these graphs are correlated, right? So they come from the same original graph. So. Then what we are doing is this, right? So recall I have these two graphs, and I'm taking this graph GC, and I'm taking actually lifting of this uh, uh, permutation of the vertices to the edges, and I'm defining this new kind of you know, permutation uh, 
uh, of the graph, right? So it's a new relabeled in some sense graph. And the goal is whether or not if somebody has access to GC and sees the public version GB, can you actually identify what was pi, right? So the anonymized. So specifically, this is our goal, right? Mathematically, we can think about it. So you want to basically uh, look at this um, posterior probability of um, the random permutation being a specific one given your observation, right? So <coughs> if, the, if we work out this probability, it ends up giving something of this form. And this one actually ends up being less than 1. So if you want to maximize this quantity, you would end up minimizing this value. So what is this value? This is really just a symmetric edge difference. So if I was talking about uh, this del G and H for two graphs, it means these are all the edges that basically are present in one graph but not in the other one. Right, so it's basically, so we see that why this, and this is the value as um, Elza was mentioning that Pedrosani was working on, but clearly it's also a very simple relationship to the map estimator. So, um, and this um, actually has been, um, so you know, in their work they propose minimizing delta without directly mentioning its relationship to map, and this relationship actually explicitly has been noted in Elza's work. So in this situation, if I want to actually maximize uh, this probability, obviously it's going to, as I told you, just the only thing you have to really remember from here is that you're doing a math decision is you want to minimize this distance, right? So without loss of generality, I'm going to assume that the, uh, the true uh, permutation that acted was the identity permutation, right, from now on. And then when I talk about the error events, I'm going to consider picking up a permutation which was not the identity. That's the case you're going to make errors, right? So the converse bound is saying this. So what is it saying? It says that if I have these two graphs and they're Erdos-Reini, and if you remember that P was the probability that you don't, you have edges in edge mismatches or matches and so on, then this is the result. So it says that if you know P11 and P11 was probability of having edges in both of them, right, is less than this amount, then any de-anonymizer succeeds with actually this small probability, right? So basically it fails, right? So you can basically get a converse bound. So this is the converse we can get. And I like it because um, it's information theoretic, right? So there is no concept of computational complexity. So it's basically telling us that if you have such a property that you know, your graph, satis the parameters satisfy this condition, no matter what the attacker do, he can <coughs> never uh, de-anonymize in that strong sense that we had, which means he cannot perfectly learn everybody's label. It doesn't mean anything about what's happening in the, you know, kind of if you relax that requirement, right? So, and then um, what is interesting is this, right? So if you look at actually in this formula, the interesting thing you see is that, you know, this threshold only depends on the intersection graph, right? Because it only depends on P11, which was when edge existed in both of them, right? So what is the idea of the converse? So the idea of the converse is this, right? So you're going to consider a special situation. So let's assume that I'm considering automorphisms <coughs> of the intersection graph, right? And what I'm going to claim is that anything which is an automorphism of the intersection graph is as good as a, a basically map decision rule or permutation as the true one. So you can never distinguish it from the, from the real one. So anything which is in that automorphism is going to make you uh, perform an error, right? So. Basically, I'm going to take all pi such that you know they're in the automorphism of this intersection graph. And then what I'm going to claim is this, is that, so remember that this is the uh, situation when I have assumed that my permutation is identity. So this is the true, basically, uh, uh, permutation. I'm going to say if you choose any other sigma, right, as long as this sigma was lifting of the pi, which was in the automorphism, you would actually get a smaller distance. So you would, it would, or equal to that, right? So it would look as good as the original one. So there's no way you can actually distinguish. So it would cause an error, right? So what we do is that, I mean, I think the intuition is kind of easy for, I mean, there are two cases here. I think it's easier first to see this case, is that let's assume I'm going to consider, so remember this is the value I care about, so I want to consider all the edges, right? So first consider edges that are in the intersection, right? So if an edge is in the intersection, and I consider any cycles, right? So I mean, for ease, I've just like, you know, it's an arbitrary cycle. But any cycle that I consider, as I use this permutation, 
it would never change the fact that this edge was still in the intersection, right? Because it's the automorphism, so it keeps the edge still in the intersection, right? No matter how many times you apply it. So then, this is also true that, you know, because it was in the intersection, obviously it's in all of these graphs as well individually. So really what it does is that it doesn't contribute um, any more to this cycle as the other one, right? So what, because you're considering this kind of symmetric differences, right? So really you're looking at this value minus this guy, right? So that's what I'm looking at. And because every edge that is uh, already in the automorphism cannot actually um, add anything to the difference. Let's say I was considering the difference of these two values. It doesn't add anything because it has exactly the same contribution to this guy as it has it under the permutation because the permutations is basically still keeping it in the same place, right? So these type of edges don't add anything, right? So let's consider now edges that are not in the intersection. So if you consider an edge which is not in the intersection, right, you might have some other situation for the cycle. This is, again, just an example. So the important thing is this, right? So these cycles are always uh, maximally uh, mismatched to begin with, right? So what I'm trying to say is that if you, know, you have a property that the edge is not in GA, but after you uh, apply this pi thing, let's say after like two application of it, it's gonna end up being in GA, right? So what you end up having is in this cycle, they're already like mismatched, right? So once I'm gonna um, apply the cycle, so this is the anonymized one, so you get a shifted, so basically the row just shifts this way, you can, only thing you can happen is some of these ones that were misaligned now are gonna get aligned, right? So every time you have an alignment in this difference that I'm talking about, you kind of lose a value, right, a count. So by basically, um, you know, so, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the contribution you would get in after you permute this G is at most is going to be as large as uh, the one you had originally, right? Or it could be equal to it. And this is just because of what's happening, right? So you can only align things, right? Because they're maximally unaligned. So this is the idea of the proof, right? So this is why this converse really works. So just, I think the only clever thing is re realizing that one has to look at the automorphism group, right? So then the question becomes, this. Okay, so I know that if I start with such pies that are in the automorphism group, I'm in trouble because they're basically as good as the true permutation. I cannot distinguish them. So the question is how many of them are and how often would you make a mistake, right? So one way to think about it is this, right? So for these <coughs> Erdos-Reini graphs, there is this result that it's known that you have this threshold of p log n over n where you know you would actually have the situation that uh, there are many many isolated vertices so just one second think about it any isolated vertices looks exactly like another one right so there's a very natural automorphism group. You can just basically uh, map these isolated vertices together. So this one is curious to so just look at the size of this and then see if this causes trouble, right? So as long as we are below this threshold that we have with high probability isolated vertices and any permutation that is going to exchange these guys is in the automorphism of the intersection, right? So then you're basically in trouble. So what we can do then is that, um, sorry. But I do more here, okay, maybe I do it later. Anyways, so what I do is I just need to consider actually what is the size of this uh, automorphism, right, on average for these random graphs, and this is how we get that bound for the converse. So that's the general idea of the converse. So how does the achievability work? So achievability is much nastier, actually. So the theorem says this, right? <clears throat> so it says that if I have these two graphs, and they're again erdos with the parameter p, as long as we have this property uh, for the parameters and they're larger than this 2 log over n, then there's always an anonymizer that actually succeeds, right? So the anonymizer can actually succeed and learn the pi. So this um, theorem actually can change, so I can... Um, so this is for any, basically it doesn't assume anything in terms of the regime where these uh, p's are. So if I make another um, assumption on my graph, which is basically I consider the graphs that are sparse and strongly correlated, which I'm going to make it clear what I really mean by that, is that then you would get a bound like this. So what is nice about this bound, as you see, it again only depends on the intersection, right? So we had a converse for this situation. So you can actually relate this achievability to the converse in that case. And they're only um, constant two apart, right? So basically, what do I mean when I say the graphs are sparse and strongly correlated? 
So what it means is this, right? So both graphs are sparse, means I don't have too many edges, right? So it means this P00 is going to uh, one. So it means probability of having uh, edges in none of them, right? So this is basically big. And what do I mean by them being actually positively correlated? It means that they exist. So this is the kind of the correlation you can find for the graphs is that, you know, so this is when you have uh, edges in both of them, you don't have it in them, or, you know, you're normalizing it by actually having an edge in only one of them. So if this actually value, which is the correlation between them, is larger than one, then you're going to say that these are positively correlated. We also discussed negatively correlated um, graphs in the paper, but I think it's kind of distracting for the purpose of a talk. So if this correlation is not only larger than one, but is actually going to infinity, this is the case we call it strongly correlated. So this is what I mean by strongly correlated, and this is what I mean by being sparse, right? So. <clears throat> So in this regime, it's kind of nice, right? Because we actually have an achievability bound which uh, is very close to the converse I presented. So if you want to think about these in terms of actually, like, what is the regime that has this property, right? So like, just to get an idea. So I mean, there's one such a regime is if you recall the Pedrosani's one that he was starting from an erdos schrodinger graph and he was then down sampling. So if in your original graph, you have basically the probability of having an edge is theta log n over n. Then, and then these uh, sampling probabilities are constant, you would have such a regime. So that would correspond to a situation when you actually have a, a sparse graph that are strongly correlated, right? So this is, of course, you can have other settings as well, but at least there is one of them I think would be nice to see that this is in fact the case, right? So as I mentioned, this proof of the, <clears throat> how much time do I have? Half an hour? Yeah. Okay, good. So basically, the proof of the achievability is pretty nasty, right? But again, it's very much uh, here is that there's one, I would say, like kind of insight here is that, again, what we find is that it's going to very much depend also um, on what's happening in the automorphism group, but it's a slightly different argument. So what we do here is that first we're going to fix the pi, the permutation, right? And then consider random graphs GA and GB. And we want to find some bound on this one. If you recall, this is what actually tells you the error probability, right? Because this is what you end up picking uh, another permutation rather than the correct one, the identity, right? And then to do so, uh, as in the converse again, right? So, and then, you know, this is for a specific pi, right? For a fixed permutation. So there's a union bound over the permutation for the, of course, the argument, which is natural. So as in the converse, we're going to relate this problem again, which is defined originally, right? Involving two graphs to another problem, which actually involves a single graph. So how do we do that? So the idea is this. So, um, I need to find the lower bound on the tail of this quantity. I'm going to condition. So this quantity is very nasty if you want to analyze it. But I would say the clever kind of idea is this, that if you condition on this one, this value, which is what is it's telling you. So it's the symmetric difference of the graph GA after you permute it compared to its original difference, right? So conditioning on this, then you can actually get a handle and analyze the, um, the, the quantity which is of interest for us from the map estimation, right? So it becomes much simpler. Again, the idea here is kind of similar to what I tell you, just to give a gist of it, is that, you know, so if I have some vertex uh, pair, like it's an edge, right, that I'm considering, so this edge is going to make a contribution to this value which I really care about. Remember, this is the distance that was appearing in the map rule, this would only be the case if, in fact, the edge appeared in the original graph, did not appear in its permutation, or vice versa. So that's the only time it's actually going to contribute here, right? So basically, if you would have a situation that I have an so let's say, I mean, this is like considering a certain cycle, just as an example. So whenever you have ones, it's telling you that the edge was in GA, and then you're going to um, uh, consider its um, permuted version, so you get it shifted, and this is basically the, uh, the row you get. And this is an example of some GB just to shown here. So the ones that, according to this definition, are going to make a difference are these type of columns. Because these are the ones that actually, as you see, you have a mismatch, right? So an edge is present in either GA, not in its permuted version, or the other one, right? So these are the only ones that are going to make a contribution. Hence, as you see, really this value is going to depend very much on what was happening in the uh, 
in uh, basically this other symmetric difference, right? So conditioning on this value, it gives you a handle on what is the um, uh, distance metric of the interest, right? So that's basically the idea. <coughs> So you just need to understand, instead of understanding this more complex um, object, just to understand actually what is going on the symmetric difference of the same graph after you do the permutation on that, right? So as you see, this is again related in some sense to the automorphisms of the graph, right? So this is why it's the essential object, right? So if you look at the bounds other people have uh, gotten here, and I'm sorry, Elza, I didn't know your uh, recent bound that you just got a few days ago, otherwise I put it here, so I apologize. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so basically, um, the Pedrosani's result, I mean, and we are changing our notation to, to basically be compatible, right? So we're assuming that you're just doing the P and then downsampling with S, right? So if you consider this situation, the achievability bounds um, basically differ slightly, and we have a converse, and the nice thing is that the converse and achievability are pretty close. In fact, I strongly believe that the converse is tight. So, but it's not as easy as one wants to prove it. Um, at least the, the obvious way I thought you can prove it, it doesn't work out, so. <laughs> so, um, and it just might be that we are not very clever, but some of you guys that, you know, I'm sure like someone like Alex, if he wants to do it, he can do it in the afternoon, right? But anyways, so. If you look at the graphs we get is that um, this is um, basically um, you know, just plotting these graphs at various regimes that we are considering just to get an idea how much these guys really differ, right? So this is the Pedrosani's upper bound is this one. And then we have our upper bound, which is uh, the middle line. And then there is the lower bound, which is the converse, right? So it kind of gives you an idea how um, uh, this, I mean, what the formulas that I just showed you in the last slides, how do they behave? Right? So I strongly believe that the converse is tight. So if we could show that, that would be nice because then it's kind of a capacity type of result. So as I mentioned in the beginning is this, right? So ideally, what is it that you want to do? So you want to release a data set, not just to anonymize, right? So if you're selling a data set, you want the people who bought it from you not be able to de-anonymize the graph, but also be able to do some sort of analytics on it, right? Otherwise, why are they paying for the graph, right? So, so you should also enable some data analytics. So one of the things that comes to mind is doing community detection. As I told you, it relates to things like polling, like learning, you know, um, various type of things about a population. But also what is nice is a lot of smart people have worked here. So there are very nice results on actually when is it uh, possible to do community detection. So, you know, that was a problem that if you choose, you can use some of the existing results, right? So we're going to consider now this important example of data analytics, which is community detection. And <clears throat> we're going to assume that communities are defined to be partitions of the vertices based on some structural property of the graph. Specifically, what I'm going to assume in this analysis is the specific example, which is this stochastic block model that I think everybody knows about. And everything I say could be done for a bigger number of communities, and this is what we have in our preprint. But to show the um, mathematical uh, kind of closed form expression, we only assume we have two communities just to make things easier, right? But nothing in the analysis requires to have only two communities, right? So if you have a um, stochastic block model, what does it really mean? It, all it means is that, you know, your probability of edges is going to depend on your label of your community, right? So it means that the probability of having edges between two guys that are in the same community is different than probability of edges for the vertices that are not in the same community. And oftentimes it's assumed that P is larger than Q, right? So it's more likely that you, you're connected to people in your own community, right? So basically, and then of course these are all IID. So there is this nice results that have appeared in the literature, namely it's on learning the communities in this stochastic block model. And I think these papers appeared simultaneously. I wasn't at the time so much following the literature, but anyways, they're in the same year. So um, I think Abe has a, um, a result on this with his co-authors, as well as Mosul and his co-authors have basically these results that they give information theoretic uh, mm, thresholds to uh, to do community detection uh, on these SBM models. And um, basically, the idea is that you know they also have very good um, um, 
they have also very good practical algorithms to do that in some cases, so it's not just uh, information theoretic. So in fact, uh, Mossels uh, provides a nearly linear time algorithm that does recovery up to the threshold. So Abe uh, basically can get to the threshold, but they have the semi-definite prob uh, you know, semi pro uh, programming framework, which is, you know, you might think it's polynomial, but given the size of the graphs, it's actually very impractical. So right, in practice, you need other type of approaches. And I think this, this is my favorite one in the whole group, not because it's my colleague, but you know. So Bruce has a very pretty version of the paper that actually, again, he uses a semi-definite one, but you know, he actually shows that you can do it all the way up to the information theoretic threshold, and also he has a bunch of extensions, right, in terms of like size of the communities growing and so on. <coughs> so just to like see what is the problem again here, it's exactly the same thing so I can like quickly go over it. So let's assume now here that GB, which is this helper graph, public graph, which is available again. So this one is also from a stochastic block model. And then uh, the vertices of uh, GB have the name of the people, so if you recall, right? But there is another stochastic block model here, which is correlated with GB, but actually has the currently private information, right? And what we do is that, you know, we're gonna try to permute again the vertices of this GA, and then, you know, um, release an anonymized version of that, right? So the goal here is this though. So you want an outside researcher be able to um, know the relationship between the sensitive tags and the community structure in GA, but you don't want them to be able to de-anonymize the folks, right? So let's say you're doing some study that you want to see if that, you know, people that belong to a certain type of group or community are more likely to have a certain condition or affiliation. So you want to be able to do that without knowing actually who was the individual, right? So that's the goal that you want to do. So the question is, can we safely release this GA so you can actually do this community detection without compromising the privacy of the people involved, given that there is an auxiliary graph available, this is basically GB. Yes. This is a very interesting point, sure. So there are many things that, first of all, I mean, there are a couple of issues here, right? First of all, this notion of relationships are all defined in a graph manner, right? They're edges. You can think about having hyper edge extension of the model. Also, you can think about a colored, uh, basically, one. So it basically distinguishes between the type of relationships as well. Our analysis did not apply to that. We didn't consider it, but you're absolutely correct. These are all the extensions. Sure. I think that's much more relevant if you're doing a, say, inference problem, I don't know, like studying something about cancer, you know, with some other, like, environmental mm -hmm. fact. Facebook mm -hmm. communities could be completely different than political communities. Yes. They're governed, they're governed by exactly. Population. So ideally, you want to have a hyper-colored hypergraph. Okay. That's absolutely correct, yeah. But we don't study that, so we barely managed to do this one, so. <laughs> so... Uh, basically, so as I said, you know, we're going to uh, anonymize these guys, and I'm going to again have this permutation pi, which also induces, you know, you can lift it to the edges, so you're going to get again the same thing as the sigma, right? So, so then uh, the goal is that, you know, you want to estimate, be able to estimate these uh, basically pi or the sigma, right? So there's another assumption we make. So for the SPM, we're going to assume that, you know, the attacker can identify the communities in both graphs and correctly match them. Right? So it only makes sense to consider pies that are also community preserving, right? So these would be the pies that we would actually consider. So for this one, actually, what we did is that we used um, uh, gloss glossers uh, formulation because it was kind of easier to handle, right? But, uh, but I still believe the other uh, formulation is more general, but uh, we just assume that for now GA and GB are correlated via this uh, subsampling that we discussed, right? 
So, and this I already explained, and as I told you, the important thing is this. So if you consider these colors to be communities, you want to actually have these pies such that, you know, they're, they're preserving the community, right? Not mapping uh, vertices from a community to another one, right? So what can we show? So this was, I think, a question Elsa got. So for this case, we can actually also um, uh, get a result and what we show is that as long as this J and GB are correlated SPM graphs, right, and I just explained how these are um, generated, then as long as you have this thing between the parameters, remember P was the um, uh, probability of having an edge for the vertices in the same community, this was in between communities, right, and SA and SP were the downsampling for the, each of the um, basically correlated graphs, as long as it's less than this log n over n, then we can again show that, you know, the probability of a perfectly de-anonymizing of GB goes to the zero, right? So this is a converse again, right? So we have a strong converse, which is saying that as long as you have such uh, properties, no matter how much computational power the de-anonymizer has, he cannot do anything, right? So the question is this though. So remember I started this problem as saying, but also I wanna let him do anonymous, also learn the communities, right? That's why I sold the graph. So far I've just given you a condition that says this is the situation he cannot uh, learn the labels. It's not interesting for the buyer of the data. It would only be interesting if also there exists an intersection between when he can do community detection and also not be able to anonymize, de-anonymize, right? So that's what we really want to ask. So then the question, you know, and I mean the proof idea here, I think I can skip it, is kind of, it's a little bit more complex, right? But it's very similar. So again, you can actually show that the map decision is going to depend on uh, so, you know, if you could kind of get the, let me see if it's here. So if you get the map estimator, which is like trying to find this permutation, given what you have observed, the permuted graph and the publicly available one, is that you can actually show that this is actually going to depend on this symmetric edge differences for the in-community and also the inter-community edges, right? Okay, so we can actually show that, and again, these values are going to be less than one. So you, if you want to maximize the uh, a posterior probability, what you would end up showing is that you have to actually minimize these type of, you know, edge differences. And then there is some, it's kind of, again, relates to the automorphism of them, but you have to be more clever here because there are these communities and so on, but I can just skip this in t interest of time. It's very similar arguments. You again want to check if, you know, it's, uh, if an edge is in the automorphism group uh, or is in the intersection graph or not. So you want to study the properties of the automorphism and then doing a little bit of uh, work, which is actually not at all difficult, on the size of your automorphism graph for this SPM models would give you the converse, right? So you can actually learn a situation again that, you know, you get a sharp threshold here, right? Uh, in terms of when you would have, again, isolated vertices. So it's really much, so you know, this is what I was answering when somebody asked if it matters you have communities. So the truth of the matter is as long as your communities are not growing with N, it's just more difficult version of the proof for the single Erdos Shrine in terms of you have to keep track of things a little bit more. But again, the important object is considering the uh, automorphism group and then considering this situation with the isolated vertices. So you get a similar type of argument and you can actually get a converse here too, right? So what is nice is again, we can also get an achievability result here, right? So in this case also, we have, so remember that I just told you that we have this converse, we have achievability, but let's once again forget the achievability. Just remember this converse, but remember I told you it's useless if you cannot learn the communities. So this is not our result, this is Abe and Mosel's result. They have this uh, situation that they say that as long as you have, and this is what Elsa had on her slide too, so as long as these conditions uh, hold true in terms of your parameters of your SPM block model, then you know that you can do exact community detection. So the question is there, is there intersection between this and what we actually recovered for the regime that you have anonymity? So it is an intersection, but I want to tell you, even if it was not a very large intersection, there is something clever you can do. So what is it that you can do? You can actually try to downsample 
So you know you already have these uh, graphs that you want to release. So instead, you cannot do anything for the public graph, obviously. But for the one you want to release, you can always try to do some down sampling of that, right? So if you would use some sampling probability of t that is actually letting you, like you know, you kind of the graph you have your GA, you're throwing away some edges from that before you release it. Then the new version would allow you to increase that uh, basically set that you can allow to do community detection, right? So basically, we would um, if you have this t thing that is your uh, down sampling and you you put this also in your um, model, right? So we need to have this property, right, that, you know, we need to find the sampling, down sampling version that has this property to allow the community detection from the formula of the um, Abe et al. But also simultaneously, we need to have this property from our requirement not to be able to de-anonymize the graph, right? So if you just do some little math and try to get rid of that T, what we end up doing is that, you know, so there exists a regime that you can actually do that and we can plot it, right? So these are Basically, you assume p is this a log n over n, and it's a logarithmic kind of interesting regime I was talking about, and q is like basically just the um, uh, scaling with b. So what you can see is this. So consider this one, please. So this uh, red one here is the threshold when I assume t is 1. So I'm not down sampling. I'm considering my original kind of you know graph g a. And then there is basically, there are two thresholds here, right? So this is the community detection threshold of Abe. And this other one kind of, I don't know what color it is. It's brown or whatever color this one is. It's our um, threshold for uh, basically requirement not to be able to de-anonymize. So this gray intersection is where you could release a graph with such parameters and then you could do community detection without compromising the labels. As I mentioned, if you try to downsample, you can actually increase that intersection, right? So why is the case, just to get an intuition, I think it's nicer to think about this one. So if you just omit the t from those two equations that we had earlier, this is what you end up having, right? So just once again, look at this formula. What is it saying? So this, um, if you recall, I was considering a regime that, you know, this is the uh, intra and inter-community <coughs> probabilities, right? So this one is really capturing the strength of the community structure, right? Because the larger is this um, value, a minus b over a plus b, is telling you how different the communities are, how strong is the communities. So, so it's not surprising, right, that when you basically, your community structure is intense, right, then you can actually, uh, you need to have a sparser, sparser or more subsampled graph, right, to, uh, so that, you know, uh, um, you basically can push it to go below the boundary for the anonymization, but it's still because community structure is strong enough, you can actually still learn the communities, right? On the other hand, if you look at this one, so what is SB, right? So SB is the basically, um, the, you know, is the fraction of the ground truth relationships that are presented in the public graph, right? Because it was the sampling of the ground truth graph for the GB that is available. So if this SB, right, is um, basically, um, in a situation that you know your GB is very much strongly correlated, like most of the edges were presented there, right? So you know, then you're in a situation that this publicly available data is very strong. It 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 basically gives you almost everything which was in the ground truth graph, right? So then it means that you can only safely release a less fraction of the private data, right? So and this is not surprising. That's exactly what your intuition would tell you. So that's in a sense that graph is telling us, right? So. And you know, and we can kind of you know study this like you know this basically is showing the direction it moves. So here is the line that a, b are equal, and then consider you're trying to in a sense uh, change the. Um, uh, so this s, b is telling you uh, uh, how f uh, how much uh, basically you have subsampled from the ground truth graph to have the public one. So you, as you can see that you know you would move in this direction. Right? So basically, it's telling you that uh, as you have a more correlated version of the public data available, then you have to you have less freedom in terms of your parameters because it's a very good one, right? So so you might need to even resort to subsampling in terms of what you're gonna release in terms of that t, right? To compensate for the fact that that's a strong. So this is the intuition, and I think what is nice about this is basically it it answers the question that 
so to me this is interesting because I believe that oftentimes when we give information theoretic converses, they're in very um, unfortunate practical settings in a sense that you think about something like one time pad, right? So, I mean, if you can exchange such a huge key, why don't you just exchange the message, right? So here we are not really changing the requirement of the problem or making it impractical, yet we give a information theoretic converse. So I think that's a kind of positive situation that says that you can do data analytics, but the attacker, no matter what, cannot uh, de-anonymize all the users. So I think in that sense, it's interesting for me as an information theorist that is basically it's not a pathological case and you still have guarantees, right? So more importantly, I mean, this is just in terms of the math is interesting for me. So we also can get an achievability bound for the community detection. And it's exactly the same one as we had for the Erdo Shrini. So we don't lose that. So again, we get just the two factor thing, but there is an achievability in this case as well. So someone was asking about conditions for this setting. So there is both the converse and achievability. So as uh, we can basically say that, you know, uh, there is still, I think, one point that I want to make is this, right? So in practice, partial de-anonymization is still the serious breach of privacy, which is what I alluded to earlier on. So the question is, what is the best metric actually for quality of partial de-anonymization? It's not even clear how you want to define these partial de-anonymization metrics, right? There are many candidates. And it's important to know, like, you know, some of these practical de-anonymization algorithms like percolation once and so on that use these C type of vertices as side information, right? It would be interesting to know how various forms of actually side information would affect this question we are asking, especially in terms of partial um, de-anonymization. So have you given any thought to whether your algorithms extend to this partial de-anonymization case, or are they all very precise that you have? So, I mean, we have given it some thoughts. So we have some ideas. What I would say is kind of half-baked, right? So we don't have very uh, clear one. So for the one in the community detection scenario, uh, we have some regimes which actually we, we make guarantees for non-exact uh, de-anonymization as well. But these are like a specific kind of, you know, regimes that we go, but not for as general as this one. Yeah, but I think it's very interesting. I think it's much more practical, right? Because what does it mean that you say the attacker cannot learn everybody? What if he learns 90% of the people? What are you guaranteeing, right? <laughs> Yes, Elsa. So, um, I have a question. I was kind of trying to understand mm -hmm. the, the later part of the community mm -hmm. detection in light of you know, mm -hmm. the different scenarios that I've presented. So, so uh, essentially, the data that you're, uh, that's kind of publicly available contains node labels as well as communities? So, uh, yeah. we don't assume the communities are given. Okay. So, we just sell data. So, the data doesn't have node labels, so they have been anonymized, right? So let's say it was, the relationships are there, but the, um, there is some sensitive information now which is present, but not the labels. But we also want the person who got it be, uh, be able to learn the communities without learning the labels. So the question is, can you release a version that allows community detection but does not give you the labels? So this is why I think somebody asked you a question. I wasn't sure I understand that question well. So if the person is here, maybe they can say if I understood it. So they were asking, does it matter? So if in your setting, you actually know the communities, right? But here, yeah, in the first setting, exactly. The further questions, you know, there could be all kinds of settings. Exactly. So what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, the thing is there are all these results in terms of doing community detection, which if you have certain parameters, you can anyways learn the community, so you don't need somebody to give you the communities, right? So the question is that, could you learn the communities so you haven't really ruined so much the data that you have lost that capability, but you still cannot de-anonymize? So you want to learn the communities, but not labels? Yes. Yeah. But uh, the, the, what you have as side information kind of gives you some labels and communities as well? Or so yes, because again, if you're in this regime, Remember that the other graph also you can learn the uh, uh, basically, so depends. Yeah, the community is on that one too, unless, yeah. Yeah, but I'm wondering whether if you have two instances of the graph, right, so they're correlated, mm. they're not perfectly the same. I guess one of the questions I had in my mind and I, that I tried to present yeah. is So this is an excellent question. We don't address that. So I only consider that. 
Yeah, so if we just want the person who bought the data be able to, on what we have sold them, learn the communities. It's interesting if the helper graph can help them actually learn communities in another regime that is not already covered, right? So because the original kind of results that I discussed, like Mosels and Abe, they don't use site information, so it's on a single graph. So you just want to learn the community <coughs> uh, in the graph, but you don't want to by itself, but you, do, you kind of want it to, be, to remain anonymous. Exactly. So this is exactly the purpose of this graph, right? So okay. this one. That's why you this one, sorry. So this, I want to have these regimes, and my claim is even if you originally this regime is not big enough, you can do clever things by subsampling your GA you want to release and still make it, you know, give you a larger kind of. Yes. Sure. Yeah, but the question is this, right? You don't want to bastardize the data, right? So there is also. <coughs> Absolutely. So. So this is an excellent question, right? So this is a more generic analysis of the problem and considering one analytics. If all you do is that you want to do a specific type of analytics, sure, you can also try to do something cleverly tuned for that specific application. This is not what we did, right, correct? So that comes to my next question. Mm -hmm. okay. Have you looked at some sort of universality? Not really. I don't even know how to define. You know, the thing is, I mean, I don't know, this might be that I'm not very good in terms of that. I mean, I thought about doing something more general, but I wasn't sure. I mean, the features that matter to you, to me, is so problem-specific, right? So the fact that I was telling you that square root of p minus square root of q, you know, uh, that you're getting, it's, it's that feature that I'm using to make my analytics is only a statistic that matters for community detection. So I think depending on what statistics or analytics you want to do, that kind of sufficient statistics is going to change, right? So I'm not clear how to do anything universal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, this is a much harder problem, though, if I may say that, right? So, and I'm not an expert on differential privacy, but as far as I know, they don't have, they usually have much simpler statistical models of their data, right? I mean, the fact that you have an object here, which is a graph, right? Or I was talking about some colored hypergraph, you can imagine. So these are very interesting topological relationships. The structure or the topology of the graph is not the same thing as assuming, let's like, say, you have some probability distribution. <laughs> yeah. But actually, it w in this model, it wouldn't change. So introducing new edges or, uh, so actually this doesn't help. So in the problem in their Erdos Reini, there is no difference between subsampling or adding edges. So in, it doesn't make a difference. I thought about that. So, so it doesn't make a difference for this model. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't matter if you're adding edges or removing them. Yes. Yes, I think so. <laughs> I thought maybe my eyes are. If I understood you correctly, you're subsampling your basically part of the graph, but it would make much more sense to densify it. Everything becomes easier, and you make 
You can also densify it, right? It, I don't think it makes a big difference, right? So we did just this subsampling as a, so for Erdo Shrine, adding edges or removing edges in terms of that delta that I'm talking about doesn't make a difference. Because the sparse instances of immunity detection are much harder mm -hmm. than denser. So That's an interesting point, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a clever thing I wasn't thinking about. It. So maybe it makes a difference not to us, but in terms of you, right, it changes the region for the, yeah. It's possible. Good point. This is possible. You know, I, I haven't worked as much, to be honest, on community detection, but it makes sense to me. The more edges you have in a clever way, you get a, that A minus B over A plus B gets big, more separated. Correct. Very good point. Yes. Okay, so this is excellent. So they're absolutely not efficient. So these are basically, um, I mean, of course, every achievability bound is is a practical algorithm. I mean, it's an algorithm, right? But they're not at all practical. So in terms of complexity, they're horrendous. So, so I mean, they're not. I mean, these are just inform. So. I don't know. I haven't worked on that. So this is something that we thought about actually considering now efficient algorithms. But I was just interested in finding the sharp threshold, right? So, so I, I didn't care. But these are not efficient. So they're actually terrible in terms of. They're, of course, you know, they could still be polynomial. So I just want to say something. Uh, in these type of problems, polynomial doesn't mean efficiency. So for instance, when I talk about the, the community detection problems, right? So. I mean, they're polynomial algorithms too, but they're still horrible because like you would have something like n to the six and n is like 10,000 nodes in a graph, right? So you really want things that are like, you know, linear or even sublinear. So, poly so polynomial won't give you something really practical in that sense. Of course, in terms of algorithms, it might, yeah, but our achievability, I believe, are polynomial, but they're nasty polynomials. How do you Uh, but it's not exactly that, right? Because what you're doing is you're, you're analyzing this cycle structure, so you just need to analyze the cycles, right? So these are basically calculations on the cycles. I can show you later like some of it, but I didn't work on characterizing it, but I believe it should be still polynomial. Like that is exponential. Yes? So if, if I work on the DMP, the uh, anonymization part, do you, do you know how much you need the parameters of the stochastic block model. Yes. So if I'm given a, just the graph, um, how do I know? Uh, I'm only given the realization, and I'm yes. not given the original uh, yes. generating parameters. Is there something I can do to figure out how much this up? So it depends who is the person. So in this setting, the way we are doing it is you assume that there is somebody who has the ground truth data that anything, let's say it's Facebook who is going to sell this. So any other kind of, you know, version of Facebook we see is anyways, you know, like that GB that is publicly available is still not the complete thing. Why these guys have the ground truth, right? So they know all the information. So you can actually, you know the P and Q. But in reality, if you consider another version of it, so let's Let's say you're somebody who doesn't have the ground truth, then uh, yes, ideally you want to consider some estimate of P and Q, but you could mess up because what I just showed you with that uh, equation that was trading off A minus B um, over A plus B squared, and then on the other side, the one minus SP. So if you're messing up estimating A's and B's, and then based on that, you're deciding on your subsampling, you can mess up, yes, absolutely. So you might want to have a margin, right, that you kind of play it safer. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Negar. <laughs>